That's extraordinary. Britain and France were fighting the Russians. John was here for the winter of 1854 to 55, the coldest in living memory. The conditions were horrifying. Britain lost 10 times more men to illness than to enemy action. As a surgeon, he must have seen more than his share of misery. So here you were, John. Hundred and what would it be? Hundred and fifty-five years ago. Yes. And your great grandson's back. November, eighteen fifty-four. Conditions already very bad. Slept in the trenches last night. Roads are so bad that it said no ration will be issued tomorrow. Twenty-eighth of November. Felt sick and ill all night. Diarrhea in the morning. The ration of salt pork today is reduced to a quarter of a pound, and that will be for several days. It's a foggy, rainy day. 29th November, dreadful day, rainy and windy, confined to the tent all day. <laughs> Got Aberdeen Journal at night, so a bit of Scotland arrives in Crimea. The Crimean War was the first to be photographed. Roger Fenton's black and white stills have preserved all the colour of a distant conflict. Image became important, and one battle of this far-off war would provide the defining moment of the Scottish soldier in the service of the British Army. The battle was in defence of this place, Balaclava. It's now a prosperous holiday resort. In my great-grandfather's day, it was the British supply base. It's strange to think, really, that it was on this scratty outcrop, almost a rubbish dump, really, between vineyards on that side and derelict factories and a boat graveyard on the other, was where the 93rd Highland Regiment wrote one of the most legendary chapters in the history of Scottish infantry. It was the morning of the 25th of October, 1854. The Highlanders were all that stood between the advancing Russian cavalry and the British supply base. It was one of the key moments of the Battle of Balaclava. In front of them, four or five hundred charging Russian cavalrymen. Behind them, the port of Balaclava. Between two lines of Highland infantrymen, the 93rd Regiment. And Sir Colin Campbell, their commander, said, there's no retreat from here, men. You must die where you stand. At which his aide, Private John Scott, is said to have replied, I, Sir Colin, if needs be, will do just that. Campbell ordered his men into two defensive lines, a highly unusual formation. Their commander, Sir Colin Campbell, commanded to stay in the line, but uh, it was a very extraordinary line. Uh, it was not a uh, usual square, four people deep. It was very unusual because it was only two people deep. There were not enough people there to form this uh, square. But uh, four, two people uh, deep uh, gave an opportunity to make this line very long. So we know what the cavalry are coming towards, this line of Highland infantry, but... What are the 93rd seeing at this stage? The 93rd saw the very, very courageous Russian cavalry because uh, the Russian cavalrymen were very brave and uh, they were very famous for uh, their courage. So you had really two, two reputations, the, the, the Russian cavalry... Clash of reputations. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> The Highlanders uh, began to, f to fire, and they fired the first volley, then the second volley. They may be the f third volley, because there are different versions as to the number of the volleys. So, and uh, the Rusovsk cavalry stopped there, didn't move. But after the third of the second volley, they turned back and they retreated. The most dramatic account of the Battle of Balaclava reaches London three weeks later, on November 14th, 1854, in a report in the Times by William Russell, famous report which later describes the charge of the Light Brigade. He says, the Russians drew breath for a moment and then in one grand line dashed at the Highlanders. The ground flies beneath their horses' feet, gathering speed at every stride. They dash on towards that thin red streak topped with a line of steel. 
and that's the 93rd Regiment. The first reference to what became known as the Thin Red Line, which was later immortalised in a, a painting by Robert Gibb, done in 1881, called just the Thin Red Line. The image of the steely Highlanders in their kilts and bearskins, standing firm against the Russian cavalry, played very well back in Victorian Britain. Balaclava's thin red line would become synonymous with the bravery and loyalty of the men from the Scottish Highlands. Scottish soldiers returned to a country becoming more tartan by the minute. The Highlands and the Highlanders had become fashionable. Walter Scott had started the trend. The novelist and arch-Tory had been horrified as Europe was convulsed first by the French Revolution and then Napoleon. The natural order of things, as he saw it, had been threatened. In common with the European romantics, he looked for examples of a traditional settled society. And like them, he found it in the Highland clan system. In the Waverley novels, he depicted the Highlanders as every bit as wild and romantic as the scenery they inhabited. By the second half of the century, the movement was all the rage, with Queen Victoria its most ardent supporter. An avid reader of Scott, she'd fallen in love with the Highlands, and in 1848 she bought Balmoral, which she called Our Own Dear Paradise. The Queen's enthusiasm for all things Scottish bordered on the obsessive. Britain's monarch would play her part in transforming the fighting Scotsman into a cultural phenomenon, a true Victorian icon. The British are falling in love with the romance of Scotland and, you know, the kilt and the pipes and all the rest of it. And so there's this reinvention going on. Queen Victoria was largely responsible for the, uh, the transformation of the Scottish soldier, her soldiers. She took a, a special delight in the um, performance of Scottish troops, which again helped to play, uh, play up to their, their changing image. The Scottish regiments within the army started to reflect this romanticism, and this tied in with the whole introduction of tartans and kilts and regimental paraphernalia. So you have lowland regiments with kilts and tartan trues and all these various fripperies and uh, Highland romantic nonsense which would have been anathema to any sensible soldier. And essentially it created the Scottish soldier as somebody that could be readily identifiable, whether he was Highland or from a Highland or a lowland background. And it gave them a shared sense of identity but also, while they were becoming the poster boys of the British Army, they also enjoyed very good PR and press coverage. So if the war correspondents or the sketch artists record anyone, they covered the activities of the Scottish soldier rather than the British Army as a whole. The great irony of the period is that at the time when the Scottish soldier had become the darling of Britain's upper classes, recruitment levels were at their lowest. Scottish regiments increasingly looked to Ireland and England to sign up new men. Changes in the fabric of Highland life threatened the very existence of Highland regiments. This is the whole period of the Highland clearances where essentially crofters who had loyalty to their clan chiefs were being replaced by sheep, which obviously didn't have much loyalty to anyone. So when a clan chief before might have essentially raised his own regiment and offered his, all his tenantry to be soldiers, um, this wasn't going to happen. And there's even the case of the Duke of Sutherland in the Crimean War. He tries to raise a regiment, and his crofters tell him pretty bluntly that this wasn't going to happen. The stream of Highland men flowing into Highland regiments was drying up. But the Highland image was a potent recruiting device. Men from all over Britain and Ireland rushed to Queen Victoria's tartan regiments, now among the most dashing and prestigious of the British Army. <laughs> 